Was 2022 the worst year yet for the electric car? It's that time of year again when everyone takes a look back at the last 12 months and talks about how great it was. But is that actually the case for the electric car? I'm not so sure. Let's go back to January 2022 when the CEO of Podpoint, Eric Fairbairn, came out to say that it was exactly the right time for government to cut grants for EVs. His announcement came after a bumper year for EV sales with them taking an 18.5% share of car sales in 2021. But is removing subsidies the right thing when the boom has only just begun? Eric definitely seems to think so, commenting, I think electric vehicles can stand up on their own two feet now. I'm not completely in disagreement with him. Removal of subsidies has to happen eventually, but it certainly set the tone for the year ahead when it comes to EVs, with price rises, funding cuts, and incentive removals very much being the order of the day. In February, we saw the usual doom and gloom around taxation, and this time it was Hugh Merriman MP, chair of the Transport Committee, who came out stating, we could find ourselves with a £35 billion black hole in the public purse if the government fails to tax electric vehicles. It seems to me that Hugh has very little appreciation for the purpose of incentives to actually boost EV adoption and move us towards those very ambitious climate targets that the government has set. There's absolutely no doubt, though, that taxation will come and it will come thick and fast. I mean, there's nothing as sure in life as, as death and taxes, right? But applying it too early will, could kill adoption stone dead especially if we found ourselves in that strange position where actually a petrol or diesel car was just as cheap to run or even cheaper to run than an EV. Very few people outside those seriously committed about reducing their carbon footprint would choose to drive an EV if there was a cheaper alternative available to them. So I think that that balance of taxation versus incentive and those achievable climate targets is a very fine one that making these sweeping statements about damage to the public purse and we really need to tax this now and we need to do this, it doesn't help anyone. And I think that we, we could definitely ease off on that a little bit and, and maintain that sort of incentive. Quarter one draws to a close with the announcement in March that the OLEV grant scheme for electric vehicle home chargers was going to end. The scheme was put in place, of course, to help achieve those ambitious net zero emissions targets for 2050, but it seems that the money or the will has now run out. Now, with all new build homes in England to have charges as standard going forward, and the price of home installation probably being inflated a little bit to fit around the grant, I mean, does that mean we'll see the, the cost of home charger installation fall? Does that mean, or does it mean that the removal of the grant will make it another barrier in the way of EV adoption? I think one thing's for sure that removal of the grant will cause some short-term pain as people need to bear the full cost of having a charger installed at the house. But hopefully, with time, costs will come down or people will have a charger anyway and, and therefore it won't present too much of a barrier to EV adoption. In April, Green NCAP issued new emissions ratings which apparently cast doubt on the electric car's green credentials. And this was something that I covered in an EV news video at the time. There's a link to that in the description if you want to check that out and get the, sort of the full story. But they're, they're in summary, they, they said the electric Fiat 500 was one of the, the cars with the, the, the smallest whole life CO2 footprint, uh, according to the new ratings, which, which monitored sort of the CO2 in production as well as in use. But then they made some really odd claims about sort of larger EVs being dirtier than petrol or diesel equivalents uh, and they were using some really questionable data which turned out they were making some really incorrect assumptions and that someone completely tore this apart on Twitter. If I can find the thread I'll put a link to that in the description so you can all read but this the green end cap thing I mean it boiled down to little more than anti-EV propaganda but what it did present at the time was quite a worrying thing you know plastered all over the motoring press saying oh look EVs aren't as clean as we thought they were and actually could have been harmful to people's perception and, uh, and a, a sort of opinion, but it was based around flawed data and, and, and things that were just simply incorrect. So I think it shows you need to be really careful with this kind of stuff when you're ingesting this, sort of the, the, all of the news sources that are out there. That they're not always quite as truthful as they claim. May brings us the first of our public rapid charging price increases with Instavolt 
announcing that they were increasing their prices to 57 pence per kilowatt hour. As we'll see as the year progresses, this was the first of many. And actually, by the end of the year, 57 pence seems reasonably cheap, which is quite hard to believe. With very little notice, the plug-in car grant comes to an end in June. The scheme, which increased EV car sales from less than 1,000 in 2011 to nearly 100,000 in the first six months of 2022, was closed on the 14th of June with no notice whatsoever, and took everyone a little by surprise. The official line was that funding would now be refocused towards the main barriers to EV transitions. Transport Minister Trudy Harrison assures that we are continuing to lead the way in decarbonising transport, with generous incentives still in place. I think a number of new car buyers that narrowly missed out on the grant would deeply disagree with Trudy there, but there we are. The summer months hit and in July, August and September we are hit with further public charging price rises. In July, Osprey increased their prices to 66 pence per kilowatt hour, followed in August by the second Instavolt price rise of the year when they announced an increase to 66 pence per kilowatt hour to match Osprey. But then in September, the big one happens that absolutely shook everyone. Osprey raised their prices to one pound per kilowatt hour, causing massive uproar throughout the EV community with many people saying, oh, we need to boycott Osprey, this is ridiculous, this is terrible. But of course, these decisions were driven by the, this instability in wholesale prices. And since then, they actually followed through on their promise. So at the time, uh, Ian Johnson, CEO of Osprey, promised that when they see reduced wholesale prices or support from the government with wholesale prices, they will reduce their prices again. And since then, they have now reduced their tariff to 79 pence per kilowatt hour, which of course, still hefty, but I have to admire that they actually followed through on their promise to do so. And 79 pence seems to be where a lot of the networks have settled, which is quite interesting. I think a few people have pointed this out. I don't think there's some huge conspiracy around pricing, but it is quite interesting that that seems to be where we are now for public rapid charging with a lot of networks. The home straight for the last three months of the year have been anything but quiet when it comes to EV news. In October, Tesco announced the end of free charging at their stores with a new tariff to apply from the 1st of November. And again, this was met with outrage across the board, with people claiming it was the only reason they actually shopped in Tesco in the first place. But there's two sides to this story. Some people think it's absolutely brilliant that Tesco are now making charges more available to their customers. They're stopping people from charging there, sitting on a charger all day just because it's free. Uh, but equally, there's some people that are butthurt that they can't charge for free anymore. And I think whatever your stance, it's quite clear that free public charging was going to end once EV adoption reaches a certain level. Companies aren't going to continue to give away energy for free, especially in light of the current wholesale prices. What I think is quite interesting is Tesco applied the same tariff to their charges at head office, where you previously could charge for free, uh, now you pay the same, exactly the same tariff as you do in stores. And at first, the charges were very empty. I think a lot of people sort of rebelled a little bit. I like people that were saying, oh, I'll stop shopping at Tesco, I won't go there. I think people also stopped charging at work. And now I would say that whilst it's not quite as back to as full as it used to be, certainly a lot more charges in use. The first week of November when the charges came in, it was pretty dead, you know, all pretty much all the charges were available, now that's not the case. So I think people are warming to having to pay, and at 28 pence per kilowatt hour for the 7 kilowatt chargers, it's still cheaper than charging at home in some cases. And it's also about the convenience. If you've got a long drive to work and you can charge there for 28 pence, you're probably going to do that rather than either hoping you're going to make it home or charging somewhere that's more expensive on the way. So. I'm not sure that the application, the tariffs, is going is killing off. I've seen people saying, oh, their charges will never be used anymore. I'm not sure that's the case. As foreshadowed in February, the autumn statement came in thick and fast in November and brought with it news that all EVs will pay road tax of vehicle excise duty from 2025. Nothing too shocking there, you might think. We all saw this coming after all, as I'm sure you tell me in the comments over and over again. But... What I don't think anybody quite expected was the announcement that it would be applied to cars previously registered. So £165 for anything registered after the 1st of April 2017, just like a petrol or diesel car. Uh, 
And £20 per year for anything registered. Before that, that was in the, the, the tax bands with a sort of 0, 20, 30, etc. And there's actually a lot of cleaner petrol or diesel cars that fall into that £20 bracket as well. Even my little Citroen Ami won't escape. It will be taxed at £165, just like a proper car will be. And I think this is a deeply regressive move, personally, that could have been handled a lot more smartly. Whether it will make it into reality with whatever government is in power in April 2025 remains to be seen, of course. I know we've reached December and the last month of the year. Now, while most of us were tucking into Turkey or opening our presents, some reports started to emerge of massive queues of Teslas stretching for hours just trying to charge at a service station or at multiple service stations across the country. It's a concerning statement about the state of the infrastructure, with even Tesla's hallowed supercharger network being subject to demand that's beyond its capacity, but perhaps a little bit over-dramatised by both the press and some of the anti-EV types that primarily were the people sharing these original videos on TikTok and on YouTube. I thought that the Teslas were supposed to be a little bit clever about showing new availability of chargers in the route planner and I think personally I'd be seeking out alternative charging options over just going and sitting in a queue at a service station but it does paint quite an interesting picture of infrastructure not quite keeping up with vehicle sales and demand even for premium networks like Tesla where you know it's pay to play you, you primarily need to have a Tesla to use a supercharger network and they, they do have a lot more capacity than other operators. I think that it shows that, yes, at very peak times, over like a bank holiday weekend or the Christmas break or whatever, capacity does struggle a little bit. I don't think it's representative that, oh my God, if you have a Tesla, you'll need to wait hours to charge. I think that's being blown way out of proportion, primarily by the people creating that content in the first place. But it is quite interesting, and I think it does almost put the icing on the cake for 2022 where we start to look at infrastructure and, and, and where we're not quite there with charge point rollouts. Should it put you off buying an EV? Personally, I don't think so at all. Uh, I think you want to think about it if you're going to be travelling on a really busy bank holiday that you might want to either you know travel at a different time of day or search for other charging options. But I don't think it should put you off completely. I mean, it's, it's one or two days a year after all. So that brings us to the end of our year in review. Has 2022 really been the worst year for the electric car? Well, it hasn't been the best, has it? Let's be honest. It's definitely more expensive and less appealing to own an EV for some people now than it was at the start of the year, with particular pressure being applied to those that can't charge at home or that regularly travel far enough to need to make regular use of the public charging network. Those price increases are going to hit hard, and I think those are the people that are going to hit hardest. Let me know what you think in the comments. Is it the worst year yet? Does it put you off? Are you going to have second thoughts when your, your car is due for renewal or whatever? Or do you think it's not actually that bad after all? Who knows what 2023 will hold, but I'd like to take this opportunity to wish you a very happy new year when it comes and to thank you for the support over the past year. If you keep watching, I'll keep bringing you the latest updates, good and bad, believe it or not, from the EV world. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.